And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me is a returning good brother to the temple, coming to us from, Disc from Discami Publishing, Creators of Big Eyes, Small Mouth, and everything involving the Tristat system, now coming back with an expansion to Absolute Power, which, we, which we've previously covered here, here in the show. The one and only Mark McKinnon. How are you doing today, man? That was great. Thank you very much for having me on again. It's wonderful to be back. Thank, as my chiropractor often says, glad to see you're back. Mm, good one. So, I... I think where we can st we can start is the is the concept is the concept present of two expansions for um, absolute power primarily. Is it, I much like with some of the previous work, the hard part was f was finding an image that I that I could use to encompass everything because th because there's so much material to um, work with. So. I suppose the first thing that we'll start we'll start with are the two ex the two expansion books, um, season one Urban Warfare and season two Dark Empire. Now, were these particular ideas things things that you had concepted during the development of Absolute Power? Or were these things that came about afterwards? Yeah. Well, whenever we we're creating absolute power itself of course it was dealing with the entire backstory um, from what happened in the real world leading up to 2020 which is when absolute power kicks off so we had silver age sentinels first edition and so we had all the information from there and then we had 20 new years between sas and absolute power and we knew that going forward we're going to be revealing more of the world and we looked at you know what do we do for expansions for absolute power because you have the 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 very individualized model that you kind of have with Dungeons and Dragons style games where you have a monster manual, you have a spell book, uh, everything is compartmentalized. And so that's one model of doing expansions. And then we had what we did with Bassam, which is more holistic look. So we had a multiverse book, which is a setting book that includes some opposition, some setting, uh, some... Uh, backstory and we thought well that's another way we could do it is we can have more holistic books going forward but because of the nature of absolute power is we are setting a superhero world that we've created called sentinel earth we're setting it and integrating it with our real world we thought the best way moving forward was to reveal the the real world and what happened in the fictional Sentinel Earth world during that same time, which led us to thinking of of annuals. I mean, comic book annuals are are something that, of course, have been published for you know since comic books were out pretty well. And so, doing annuals seemed to make sense, and lumping them by year was an obviously logical way given that we had it up until the end of 2020 was the core book and so doing a 2021 annual doing a 2022 annual we thought that was a great way that we could move the setting along while introducing new characters and concepts it what ended up changing is changing the titles from a 2021 annual and changing into season one we we decided to move a little bit more away from the comics towards maybe what people are familiar with more television or other media but also avoiding having a year on the cover of a book which you know, automatically dates it even though you know absolute power starts in 2020 it doesn't mean that once 2020 is done you, you can't play the game anymore it's just how the the setting was set up so by focusing each of those expansions around a season and the season was the year of 2021 that was urban warfare for season one and season two was all the events in 2022 that seemed to be a, a good way for us to move forward and so we had the concept back when we were doing absolute power looking at the expansions but it wasn't until you know a year later that we actually had a chance to to get it out and on the road like robin was working on the season one and season two before the core book was in people's hands that's how far ahead we have to work with with art with writing and uh, conceptual design so, given given that, and give and given how it's how it could how it could be argued that you're building around the idea of the of 
those giant size issues, which would eventually become the equivalent of what event comics are nowadays. Um, what's uh, with urban with urban warfare? What sort of theme were you were you building around for that season, as opposed to the as opposed to the theme that you were building around with um, Dark Empire? Yeah, in each of the seasons, of course, we do cover you know the the stuff going on in the real world so that is covered but then there's also the new superhuman uh components and in season one we cover kind of two different things one is the urban warfare aspect and this is involves the the evil eyes that works for the commission and and that superhero group going up against the five shields and invading the five shields territory the, the evil eyes they need to produce some recruiting they're looking at some people onto the roster and they get into a bit of a fisticuffs with uh, the the five shields but that also leads into the second component which we wanted to focus on were the superhuman you know, academies or schools and so we have a japanese academy and we have a u.s academy these are kind of the, the two biggest superhero schools around and that was involved partly with the recruiting where the evil eyes wants to to get some new members on board and so they're looking at these schools as one of the potential recruitment options but it also allows us to focus on uh, that as a as a component of the the book so while it is a setting book we're also dealing with super powered campaigns for teenagers and for school academies and so we're going into a little bit of that with suggestions and advice and a little bit of details about the characters and setting was something we focused on in season one that's kind of the the main goal and urban warfare seemed to be a good title for that with season two dark empire right that's heavily focused on the dark empire universe which is the parallel universe uh one of the many parallel universes but it's the one in particular that initially invaded during silver age sentinels as we were writing that book we had a little uh a vignette about how a evil version of the guard came through and so in dark empire not only do we get a chance to go into what happened if they there was another invasion and expand that even further to involve some of the uh, the the white rook rooks they are our super villain team now there's a, a good version of them called the red knights and they also came through and then that leads to some of the other parallel universes as well whether it's silver earth and what's happening there uh, and the cosmology so in addition to dealing with the different universes Versus, uh, uh, which are parallel, we also talk a little bit more about planets and what's happening with you know some of the the spaceships that we have for the uh, the the Howard Empire and the demons that we have, uh, and so that was the kind of the two different focuses that we have. Why they're they're separate, but also uh, you know seamless, picking up from where the core rulebook for Absolute Power started. Now. I'd like to focus in a bit on urban warfare before I get to Dark Empire. <clears throat> so, I think the I think the first thing the first thing I'd want to ask is on um, Five Shields Corporate Park. Like, what kind of area that is with it within the sit within the Sentinel Earth setting, and what kind of encounters somebody could ex or some kind of sto or story seeds one could expect to have within that area. Yeah, well, certainly with with these books, while they are, you know, nearly two hundred page books or, or larger than two hundred pages in terms of season two, they're they're not modules. They're not just setting books. We do have half the, of each book roughly are is the dramatis personae section. Here's all the the new characters we have with the superheroes and the villains. And so with the Five Shields Corporate Park, this isn't a place where you'd go and oh, here's a map of every building and and here's where you can go for your adventures. We we don't run those types of expansions. That's not what these books are. These are more uh, conceptualized and overall uh, setting and some of the individual components. So we do talk about, you know, the buildings and some of the security on the buildings and, you know, here's some of the emplacements that they have for cannons that protect it. And here's a little bit about the organizations behind the Five Shields. And then, of course, outlining what happens with the interactions between the Five Shields and the Evil Eyes and, and uh, you know, who gets hurt and what comes from that. So we... We do go into details like that, but we're, this isn't a module where you have an adventure there specifically and we're outlining what the adventure is. We are showing what happened in the Sentinel, U, uh, Sentinel Earth universe. And then, of course, you can then run with what we present to hold your own adventures if you want to have your characters come and visit the, the Five Shields Corporate Park. You can go ahead and do that. Yeah. 
Now, obviously, one of the other big elements is the um, training centers for young superheroes. Um, Yamatai Academy in Japan and Harrison Academy in the U.S. Right. Um, now, given the given that they are are a central piece, and th this idea of 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 villains trying to recruit young superheroes, um, I th I'm pretty. It, it seems very natural that there that there would be um, associate some some ref some inference to things like X Men or Teen Titans, and I'm. I am curious if that did serve as an influence, and if not, what sort of what sort of comic events served as the appendix N of sorts for urban warfare? Yeah, certainly the uh, with the headquarters. I mean, we say here's a Japanese school for superheroes, and with the Harrison Academy, a U.S. school for superheroes. I mean, the obvious parallels of My Hero Academia and the X Men's and you know, Professor Xavier's. I mean, that those are are very logical conclusions. And of course, bringing in as you mentioned, Teen Titans, where where the younger group that all plays into about running teen hero campaigns. And we have a little section about running team heroes, and you know the the different types of teen hero games you can run. So, so again, we set up the the philosophy and the general structure of the Yamatai Academy. We and Harrison, and we give here some of the faculty, here some of the students, but we don't have a you know a roster of here's all 80 students that are at the academy, and here's the entire faculty list. We're providing a sampling, and we're providing something that you can take and integrate with your campaign. But there's still so much more room to to take your own spin on stuff, and so uh, that's you know when you when you said X Men and you know, Teen Titans, that certainly very much fits in with the kind of overall philosophy you're going with. And then, of course, with you know, Yamatai has a, you know, a little bit more wacky in, in Japan, of course, as going to have a, a little bit more of an anime feel to some of the aspects there. But in the end, uh, these this is our, our superhero game, right? Not our, our Bessem or, or an anime 5e game. Mm -hmm. Now, given that, um, what sort of relationship do the two academies have with each other? Do they have some sort of rival some sort of rivalry that could be utilized by GMs or is there or is there some other relationship yeah, I mean, generally you're going to always have some sort of rivalry between organizations, but more or less that they are, you know, they have it for exchange students that, that you know, you student for one would go to the other for a while. I mean, geographically they're they're quite far apart. Although in a superhero world, geography isn't maybe quite as as big of a as impediment as it would be now. Uh, and there will be competitions, like for example, during the uh, the the 2020 Olympics, which actually didn't run during 2020. It was pushed back to 2021 in Japan. Uh, we have that there's a parallel organization that runs uh, special events for the superheroes and so we have people from the Yamatai Academy competing against people from Harrison Academy in Japan during the Olympics in superhero like events and so this is something that you know we thought was it was a nice way to tie the two together but because they are so far apart I mean they're, they're going to be colleagues and, and they're producing superheroes not supervillains so of course they're going to work together uh, anytime something comes up where they they need to but it's they're considered separate Now, with the, with that in with that in mind, oh, since you since you brought up the whole thing of the, of them engaging in those kind of games, did you do you have a, do you have anything in the book regarding GM advice if they want to um, use want use one of those Olympic leg events as a backdrop? So what we do with all of the events in uh, the two season annuals is we have, you know, we present the factual events and this is what actually happened in, in the real world. So we present, yeah, here's, there was a Tokyo Summer Olympics and we have a brief section about that. And then we have a metahuman reaction to that. And, and here's what happened with the metahumans during that time. And you know, there was a bit of a disruption. Whenever you have a bunch of people gathered in one place, it's a great opportunity for supervillains to to try some stuff and, and, and pull something. And so the heroes have to get together and deal with that. And so we, we give some, what I would call, uh, suggestions through examples. So by showing people how we, what happens in our world that is providing the suggestions of how you can integrate within those real world events we don't uh, this isn't a specific list of you know here's what you should do but we you know, we give some game seeds we you know here's some suggestions but in the end um we're providing 
a, a sandbox box for you to play in and we show you what happens in our world now take that and run with it and make it your own mm -hmm. now shifting into dark empire um earlier earlier on i mentioned the i mentioned um sort of the appendix n for these sort of things the first thing that came to mind for me when it came to dark when it came to dark empire or things like the the justice lord story arc from justice league unlimited or um crisis on two earths also, also from that um were there any were there any other event comics that come to mind that kind of served as a template for you guys to build around with dark empire yeah, yeah, certainly with, with the two you mentioned, uh, you know, would, would take their place. But, of course, anytime you have a parallel universe, uh, evil versions of good heroes, uh, that's that's a staple for comics. And, the, you know, not just comics, and for Star Trek, you know, where, you know, it was my, that I keep going back to is the Mirror Mirror episode on Star Trek where the evil Spock has the beard. And, and so we, you know, hey, we got to put that beard on White Sentinel uh, as the, the evil version. To indicate he's evil, he has to have a beard. Uh, I mean, that was something that has carried through uh, so many different genres uh, in the fandom and so yeah there's you know many many different examples you can look at in the comics where that happens and you know, right now as we know in you know, superhero media multiverses are big whether it's the spider-man multiverse or or doctor strange certainly in the movies as, as well as comics uh these multiple universes are very popular right now and this is a great opportunity for us to to go back and revisit something that was a very brief section in, in silver age sentinels and now we've had a chance to expand it out and actually make it a, a central point of an entire book yeah and I've, I have off. I have joked a few times that the this emphasis on multiverse is certainly nothing new. Like the 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 most influential event comic in DC's history is Crisis on Infinite Earths. Infinite Earth, absolutely. I mean, that's you know, while that was not you know the evil parallel Earth, but that's the multiverse you know example, and certainly in the in the DC universe, that's that's the prime. Yeah, and even be, even beyond that. Oh, there, there's been, there's been stuff like the Quantum Leap TV series and um, the TV series Sliders when I was growing up, mm -hmm. and doing a multi. I I know a lot of people like to say that multiverses is one of those things that you shouldn't do because it makes things overwrought. I've always argued that you can do you can do it, but it's one but it's one of those but. It's one of those things that is akin to adding spice to a dish. You should only use a sm you should only use a small controlled amount of it. And I, I don't know about you, but I don't feel like dowsing my dowsing my chicken in cilantro or anything like that. <clears throat> right. Yeah, and and even with. Uh when you're dealing with the these multiverse aspects even if they're not straight up parallel versions the reality is when we're role playing we often role play a a version of another character i mean that that's certainly so common especially with something like you know Dungeons and dragons where people are like oh i want to be just like drizzed but i'm not drizzed uh you know we have sentinel sentinel is very similar to a superman and captain america kind of combined and we you know that's not as it's not a secret it's not a surprise but when you look, even look at within the comic book continuities where the authority uh, is very clearly the midnighter is a batman character and apollo is a superman character and so even within their own universes they often have versions not parallel versions these aren't mirror images these aren't evil versions but we look to the 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 classical uh, archetypes and what is batman and superman and wonder woman and spider-man if they're not archetypes when I mean, they they are and so when we're role play we're always using these as archetype which is one of the reasons we want to put so many sample characters in uh, our expansions because the the characters can be used as templates to to empower players to then take their own version of a character like that and and through an expression of an, a character or an event that we already have they can create it you know, their own way mm -hmm. and the big reason I brought up um, much older examples of multiverses is to demonstrate that, that this interest 
in a in mul in multiple or parallel universes is not what is not what people is not what we considered new. It's the same reason when the isekai debate came around, I said, I had jo I had jokingly said John Carter is technically speaking an I an isekai, and that was made a hundred years ago. <laughs> <laughs> Alice in Wonderland. Uh, yeah. Jury's out on how, on how much of that was another world and how much of that was Alice tripping balls. Right. <laughs> but the but the concept but that concept is not new, is not necessarily speaking new. And I've always argued that if if somebody and hope and maybe this is something you guys have di have dipped into as well. If if we're going to be doing this idea of the the evil version of the of the heroes i think that i think that should apply both ways you know a good version of the villains <laughs> yeah yeah and that's we we have that with the red knights being you know the big one so instead of cruise rider we have crusader um and instead of you know mr matthews we have a dr matthews and these are characters where you know something in the past changed you know they were dissimilar up until a certain point and maybe there is a a fixed event that changed things or maybe it was overall situations and yeah in the core silver age Sentinels, we only hinted about the the evil empire guard we haven't didn't really talk about beyond that this is an opportunity for us to go much more whether it's the good versions of the the villains from sentinel earth but also what's happened with some of the neutrals and the fact that some people are on the same side or hasn't changed sides or maybe they've stayed in the in the middle of them and we have a chance to to go into more of them than and we would have in the original absolute power or silver sentinels and of course the of course the other aspect of it is making sure that the rules for crossing over dimensions or how they relate um stay consistent well of course the advantage you have with superheroes is you can kind of do any kind of hand waving you want in terms of uh, you know getting across dimensions and we, we have our rule system but in the end story rules overall of course Yep, rule zero is a thing. It's more of when you've pit when you picked the whatever hand wave is used, make sure to stick. Make sure to stick to it. Is is kind is yeah. kind of what I meant. Oh, oh yeah, no, certainly. And when you have people with characters with power over dimensions, I mean that's their their magical power are dimensions, and with the dynamic powers attribute, uh, that opens up a lot of options. Obviously, of what you can do. Yeah, I for in an, in an, I remember for a previous superhero campaign, I. In, even though I I don't feel like I I fully was able to pull off what I wanted, um, I ended up envisioning a character that I called Decade. The idea being is that his, is that his sense of time isn't as fixed as everybody else. He exists simultaneously five years up to five years in the future, and up to five years in the past. Hence the name. Mm. The the idea being that he's a, he's able to. He's able to be aware of his of his past and future self at the same time. It's just that cert he puts more emphasis on certain points, and it's it's constantly shifting as time goes on. So he can, so in a roundabout way he can communicate with his past and future selves. Mm. If that sounds confusing, well, like <laughs> I said, I didn't I didn't feel like I was able to fully get fully get the concept right. It just started as a what if that wouldn't leave my brain. Right. Yes. <laughs> But I will I will note that one of my favorite um, rule sets when it comes to when it comes to dimensional travel is translation that's used in the Strange, which is a RPG under the um, Cipher system. The idea with that one is that you're not traveling between dimensions; you're translating between them, mm -hmm. and in doing so, you're taking on a a form that is that is meant to fit in with that particular dimension or even micro dimension in some places right because it it would be kind of strange if you showed up as a human in a dimension where humans don't exist mm. so in translating you'd end up taking a form that does fit that particular dimension right yeah, I mean that's certainly a, like a, a possibility to express a super power like that. W with absolute power being an effects-based system, we have rules that kind of give it the effect, and the effect could be 
moving from one dimension to another but how that comes into play that's up to the players to to flavor as they wish according to what either what the gm sets up as their cosmology or what is appropriate for their character concept mm -hmm. of course it's not the only thing that you have go you have going in since the since there's all there's also the issue of kaiju showing up in japan and in the mediterranean yeah, with, uh, you know, Dr. Draconian is something that, you know, she is millennia old and she's our, our queen of kaiju. She controls her monsters, she summons them, she can create them, uh, and she turns into a dragon herself. Uh, that is, you know, one of the things that, that she does. She has a human form, but she can turn into a dragon. And other than General Winter, who is certainly our, our biggest human uh you know, humanoid type character in the game. This is the largest, uh, you know, monster style uh, character that we have in the game. And yeah, we finally got a chance to have her show up, uh, you know, and of course she's going to interact with what's happening uh, with the Yamatai Academy and what's happening in Japan. Mm -hmm. And there's also a few group headquarters that are, br that are brought up like the order or the Ascension Institute. Um, what can you tell me about, th about those head, about those headquarters? Yeah, so we again because we're we're not you know creating a book specifically about those. We do provide the locations and the the general structure and the organization of it. And some of this information, of of course, about the organizations. Like if you want to find out more about the order, you can look in the core books as well. But we talk a little bit about you know what it what their buildings are and what kind of defenses they have. What you're going to need if you wanted to break into them uh, and. You know what are some of the accessories that we have we have different items that we will also stat out in the game and so you know here's some spacecrafts for example that's that is the uh, at the Ascension Institute. They have access to certain crafts, and so we'll give you stats for those crafts. But we're not giving four plans. That isn't the the kind of the focus of what these expansions are. Mm -hmm. Of course. Now, moving from moving from that. Um, Obviously, there's the heroes and villains deck, though there's there's not going to be a whole lot for me to dissect with with that. I mean, it right. it, it is exactly what it is what it says on the tin. But when it comes to the path of absolute power, the anth the anthology book that you, that you're um put, that you're putting mm -hmm. together, um, how did this particular idea come about? Especially given the lengthy amount of authors that you have involved. Yeah, well, whenever we were doing Silver Age Sentinels back 20 years ago, we had two anthologies that we pulled together. Uh, one was called Path of the Just and the follow-up with Path of the Bold. Uh, we ended up winning an Origins Award at that time for you know the best uh, fiction uh, for a game category, uh, which is great. And we had some awesome authors uh, come together to write a short story with that. And so we, it was a great way to have different writers write uh, not something that is what I would say canon in the sense that we didn't create it, so we can't say it 100% integrates it, but it's a chance for character uh, writers to either create new characters and insert them into our world with what's happening, or uh, perhaps even have write a story about some of the characters that we uh, have presented if they want to write something that's a little bit more uh, fully integrated with the setting. And so, you know, fast forward now to Absolute Power, and while... It would be. It would make sense. We would love to to do a comic for Absolute Power. That'd be great. But you know, the finances it doesn't. It doesn't make sense financially. It's very difficult. It's even as difficult as RPGs are. It's even more difficult to be a successful independent comic uh, publisher. And so we thought going back to the model of doing a third path. Uh, you know, path of just path of the bold, and now we do the path of Absolute Power. Uh, and that kind of spin about you know how the world has changed over these past 20 years and that it's not quite as silver agey uh, as the original game was and so at that point once we made the decision then it's just uh, putting the call out uh, reaching out to some authors we know putting the general call out uh, in, to make it public if kids think of the people that we had made submissions that we don't know at all but in the end they submitted some great uh, stories we've had some people that are well in the gaming industry uh, and they are now moved on to more fiction uh, like Aaron Rosenberg for example and so you know reach out to, to him uh, he was happy to jump on board and write something and so we have a great collection of 14 stories 
that are integrated within our setting, but some of them are more tangential, some of them are more uh, intimately uh, you know, entwined. One of them is about a story that involves Slipstream and Stasis from the Order, like some of the characters we actually have, and we have a, a story written specifically about what's going on with that and, and Alice, Queen of Hearts, uh, in there and how that relationship with Slipstream. And so it's a, a great accessory it's not essential it's, it's not a, a game book it is a, a sh book of short stories but uh, i love the first two i thought that they're great i love reading through to see what different writers have come up with uh, to create a superhero story within our universe and this is a great opportunity that made sense to release it with a uh, uh, the season one and season two mm -hmm. now is it is it a case where you where um are are each of the stories that are in it based on characters that are with it that are within um, absolute power currently, or were or were some stories um, involving their own characters? Oh yeah, no, some are definitely involving their own. Uh, they may have their own characters, but that they set it with key moments. Uh, f for example, they may say, well, here's my two characters or my one character, uh, but they're going to be interacting with things that we talk about in the core rules. Or they could be ones that are uh, completely divorced from anything that we present, but they're just really interesting takes on superheroes living in a superhero world uh, that we have. Uh, and so it was really up to each individual author, and we got a a good spectrum that covers uh, many different story types, and I, I think it's a it's a great collection for that. But yeah, it does vary. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and in that same in that same vein, when you when I will admit when I when I heard anthology, the first thing that came to mind is some is how Uatu ends up acting as the narrator for all of those what if stories. Oh, right, yes. <laughs> I mean, I guess you can kind of say some of them are, or could become a little what-if-like, uh, but, I mean, they're, they're super heroic short stories on their own. Mm -hmm. I mean, beyond, beyond that, beyond that I, could, I, I, could, I was tempted to make a Rod Serling joke, but that might be a little bit too easy. <laughs> you know, you are entering a new dimension, a dimension yes. of comics. <laughs> <laughs> it could have done that. It, we we do actually have some dimension crossing in uh, some of those stories as well. Yeah, the problem is if I do it, it's going to be way too obvious, and I'll get called out. Uh, that's true. <laughs> that's the problem with all my players are as John are as genre savvy as me. Oh, but given now, one thing that I find kind of interesting is that. The last time with with absolute power, you ended up going through Kickstarter, and for this one, you ended up using Backer Kit. Um, what pro what prompted the um, the setup on Backer Kit for this one? Yeah, so this is something that's new for us. We've used BackerKit on the, as the pledge manager for all of our campaigns, but we haven't used them for crowdfunding. I mean, there are a number of different crowdfunding options. We've always used Kickstarter, uh, but we had a chance to talk to the BackerKit representatives at Gen Con. We were there, and you know, they told us a little bit about their their platform, and we thought it was a good idea to try something a little different that integrates more fully with our uh, pledge manager system that we're automatically using. So that seemed to make sense and doing it with absolute power uh, was a good fit for what we're looking at. We really like the uh, the tools that they have for the backer kit platform in terms of the customization and the formatting you know on the, on the back end the stuff that the customers don't see but on the back end it's really uh, a, a great platform for that and so it was something worth trying. Uh, another thing that that is with Kickstarter and very much changed from the way it used to run is running back-to-back uh, -back campaigns where you're running them over time so you don't fulfill the first one before you run the next one. Uh, Backkit has really uh, pulled back on allowing customers to do that and we've had some some good success with what we've done of course because we we usually don't run our crowdfunding campaigns until the products are finished or just about done we don't like doing them too far in advance if we can avoid it and so uh, we fulfill the pdfs so the digital copies much sooner but the reality is with you can run into a a situation where you, we want to launch a new backer kit for or a new kickstarter but the previous one wasn't fulfilled, and that causes some red flags with Kickstarter. I know 
companies that have run five, six, seven of them have not have them fulfilled. And this is something that I know Kickstarter is trying to crack down on. And so while we, we haven't run any flags and we've been great working with Backerkit, or sorry, with Kickstarter on this, uh, in our current campaign that we had with um, Fulstavia, uh, the books are at the printer, they're just coming over the ocean now. And so we could have probably run with Kickstarter for this one, but this just seemed like, like why not try a different platform to see if the advantages are there we know that the eyes there are more eyes on kickstarter than anywhere else but we thought with a a more niche product like absolute power we could probably attract people to where we're looking at and that was a great chance for us to try something new so we hope that the backers enjoy the experience and, and think it's a good thing uh we think it's it's good if there's variety uh competition uh it'll make all the different programs whether it's game found or backer hit kickstarter uh, a few of the other ones uh, indiegogo for example and we think that uh, competition's good and this is just uh, our chance for us to try the new one mm -hmm. that cer that certainly makes sense <clears throat> now earlier i had earlier before we went live i had mentioned wanting to do a little bit of a experiment and this is as good of as good of a time as any to tra to transition into that so there's a, I've mentioned this before, but there's a batch of characters that I that I had um, built that. Hey, Melga. Uh, hmm? Oh, hang on a second. Sorry about that. Discord decided to derp on me. Oh, great! <laughs> I was wondering what happened there. Yeah. Oh. But there's a cast. There's a there's a group of characters that I had built as a kind of UA Great Lakes experiment, and I talked with you about this before we went live. And what I'd like to do is kind of give you the skinny of, of each and how you might um, adapt them within within the um, within the sandbox. I was going to say confines, but that doesn't quite fit with of um, absolute power. <clears throat> you know just. Obviously, not doing a full character sheet for each, but just where you might right. lean in terms of what, in terms of um, things you might put into their particular sheet. Mm -hmm. So, first one I'd start with is Finn Hako, aka Foxfire. Um, his particular quirk is is basically being a basically having the kind of kit that a Kitsune would have. You know, he ha he has a lot of fox leanings. He a lot of illusion stuff, a lot of illusion stuff, so and some um, pyromancy. His big, his big thing is him being the class clown of the group and re and resident troll, because mm. he lo he loves screwing around with pe with people, and whenever somebody asks him something he doesn't feel like tell telling the whole truth about, he will say ancient Chinese secret with a exaggerated accent. And if you're right. wondering why would he why would he make that joke when he's when he's when he's half Japanese, not Chinese? That's the joke. Right, right. <laughs> Whenever he says that, it's basically a tell for saying I know, but I'm not telling. Right. Because <laughs> his mother is Japanese and his father is Scottish, mm. which results in a and the family has has used training him and has trained him with the guise of a long-running prank war that the whole family gets involved in. Oh, yeah. And... Well... You've, you've, you know how chaotic family reunions can get. Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, it sounds like, uh, based on what, you, what you've described, a lot of those types of decisions are more role-playing decisions where people decide they don't need, you know, we don't need numbers or game stats to have a character that acts in a certain way. Although, depending on how far it goes, they could end up taking a, a defect uh, called social fault where, you know, if they are just a little quirky, a little too much, that it causes some problems either for them or for their group. Maybe they have one or two social faults that apply with that. Uh, there's also something if he did want to bring a mechanic to something if they're always making these comments and it's throwing people off there's something we have called taunt uh, what taunt is is it forces a um uh, an obstacle on people's dice rolls that you're dealing with under either certain circumstances or all circumstances depending on where how many 
you know levels you have in taunt so this is something that if they're talking in a way that's throwing people off their game and they're you know whether it's in combat or in you know with skill roles for example uh that could be something and then of course anything regarding illusions you know that we have a straight up illusion uh, attribute and it sounds like kind of a combination of those probably will will fit the bill for that character mm -hmm. so next on the list is cal bridger aka jet falcon his particular skill set is being able to control um, technology and, cre and create get and create gadgetry al almost on the fly. Even customize gadgetry that he may already have. Um, I have likened him to to something not too far removed from Forge from X Men. In term, the catch with the catch with his stuff is he needs to understand what he's messing with before he well messes with it. So if one was one were to look in his dorm room, you'd see it covered in blueprints from on ev on every single wall and several on the ceiling. Um, mm -hmm. Right. Because his his big thing is that he is that he built a cu he built a custom modular harness for him for himself to uh, to allow him to fight on even footing. Hmm. Well, certainly the gadgeteer type, we have some of those right in our, our core book. Uh, for example, Slipstream, our speedster, he has uh, what it was called the dynamic powers, which could also be a power flux. Is it just a different ver way to express the same thing, which is a very flexible uh, category, and you choose a category that you focus on. And with Slipstream, we focus on his category's quick tech. And so this is something that he can put something together relatively quickly, uh, and this is you know on the fly the we do add some additional restrictions on his ability for this for example he needs equipment he needs to have a toolkit so you know if you get someone that has the quick tech ability but they don't have the, any tools then maybe they can't put it together uh, there's also you know consumable equipment so you can't make something out of thin air uh, this isn't what slipstream can do if a character could they might have a uh, something that allows them to transmute uh, the air into an object and so the transmute attribute is something that uh, the character could have so certainly running with either the dynamic powers or uh, power flux uh, those are the best way to represent gadgeteers in addition to they would probably you know that person would have a, a skill group probably tactical maybe scientific depending on the types of gear that they work with uh skill groups would play into there and then a, a high mindset uh, you know uh, with their great intelligence mm -hmm. so the third on the list is zaha radamarker aka hard case who in in theory in theory one could say that she's a power mimic but there is a catch She's not able to mimic powers that she's seen that she's seen directly. She creates constructs which utilize that power. The limitation she has is she can only make two constructs, but with further development she can make more. Each one assigned one power each or one effect each. That's interesting. Well, certainly, uh, with we do have the mimic abilities, uh, and we have several characters that have mimic. Although those specific applications that what you're referring to would probably involve uh, some uh, limiters that would limit the conditions under which they can mimic stuff. Uh, we have you know some characters that can nullify and mimic at the same time. So that that would be effectively be stealing someone's powers for a short period. It doesn't sound like that's what that character can do, uh, but you could certainly you know go in in that direction if you wanted to with a mimicking type ability. But certainly you know we, the the mimic power that we have is exactly what they would have. They can create it, but the idea of of not seeing it directly that that's a very interesting. Uh, limiter and something that our system can handle. It's just never something that uh, we don't have any characters that are, fall into that category. Mm -hmm. So, so it would it would be tricky, but the the idea with this was to try and make a power mimic that wasn't doing the obvious with um, power mimicry. Right. In other words, I didn't yeah. want to just make I didn't want to just make rogue or super scroll right. or something like that. 
Yeah, and and there's you know there's variations of the different mimicking. Like we our our character Minuet, who has the mimic ability. What she has is also a, uh, a a mimicking database, and so this is something that she doesn't have to see you or touch you like they do in, in, in Rogue, for example, you know, if someone touches you and takes your ability uh, or copies it, uh, all they have to do is is do it once and then that's now part of their database and they can bring it up later. So they're they're doing mimicking later on. Once they mimic it once, then they can go ahead and, and do that same mimic later on. Uh, and that's something that we have with one of our characters where other characters don't have that that database that they have to actually, you could do it one at a time, but they have to interact with them when they do it. And it sounds like the character you create is, a, is another variation. Mm -hmm. So next, uh, next on the list would be Oscar Venegas, a.k.a. Pacha Kamak. Um, he is an earth manipulator, but it's specifically built around making melee weapons and armor for himself. Because he kind of styles himself akin to a jaguar war, an Aztec jaguar warrior. Mm, right. And I guess I could, I jokingly called him the Bakugo of the group, but he's definitely the bully. He think he believes himself to be the strongest in the class, and he de and he demands respect for it. <laughs> So with the with the elemental, uh, certainly, obviously, you know, elemental control is is a very common superhero power, and there's ways to do that with uh, dynamic powers or power variation in our game. But it sounds like it does the character mainly focus on weapons? Focus on focus on using earth materials to build um to build his particular weapons and armor. Right. Okay. So it's interesting. If something like that happens, what the the using the earth materials almost the the flavor as opposed to the effect in an effects based system the effect is the weapon and so what he has is he has a number of different weapons that they have access to and then the the flavor is that it's doing through the earth based effects so i would actually focus more on uh changing out weapons than anything else like probably a, a power variation uh attribute where you're going to be focused on weapons and then you can flux over points to make weapons customized so oh this one's really good at penetrating through armor this one instead is much more blunt and it's uh, you know, uh and this one here is uh, you know encases your legs and sort of mobilizes you i would actually probably focus more on the weapon if that's the the true app application and what they do as opposed to someone who is a, an elementalist who controls earth and that's their main focus then that's a kind of a different focus that you probably put with dynamic powers at that point mm -hmm. uh, next on the list would be aldrich philby who go whose hero name is vibrato he's a bit he's a bit of a theater kid <laughs> to the point where he's dramatic about everything but he is a perf he's a perfect mimic um a which which because of that he's he's legally required to wear a specific mask because nobody ch nobody's going to trust whatever face he has under it since well he can look like just about an just about anyone um mm. though he is also able to manipulate vibrations around him to create essentially ghost sounds which is commonly used it for comedic effect to create a one-man orchestra <laughs> well we've already talked about yes we have have mimic powers with something like that can change their their form because mimic would be uh power manipulation and power mimicking where going with different alternate identities we had to change your face and you can go into full shape shifting uh, if that's necessary with the the sounds we have something called control environment and so you'd have control environment over ambient noise we have some characters that can do that uh, and so that's just a really simple thing to do it, it's not a really expensive because it doesn't have a huge game effect, but it's a nice flavor uh, attribute. Mm -hmm. So, the next one on the list is Marcus Houch, aka Backdraft, who's kind of the stiff neck of the group, and in, in part because he comes from a long line of firefighters. Originally, he thought that his quirk was just his um, particular power set was just being fireproof. What it actually is is that his body is absorbing and then re and then rechanneling energy that hits him. Um, and the, even though he utilizes a shield, it's it's not a Captain America thing. It's more it's more akin to a to a riot shield that has a um, collapsible ladder, you know. Because again, he's again firefighter. 
Um, right. Incidentally, when I was trying to come up with come up with designs, I was trying very very hard to not come off, not have it come off similar to the designs in Fire Force because I knew somebody would bring that up. <laughs> right. <laughs> and with uh, with Fire, uh, certainly, you know, you can. What you're describing, we have abilities where whenever you're taking damage, you can either convert those into points to acquire other attributes, or you can convert them into points for health points. And so, you know, if they're using it to power themselves uh, with the the fire, then I would say that's probably a, a form of a damage conversion uh, as opposed to a damage absorption, which is in, getting healthier. In his in his case, he's when he get if he gets hit with something like fire, he can he can store it. And then, re then release it in fire blast of his own. That's kind of how his relationship with different types right. of energy work. Yeah, and that would be uh, because the limiter, unlike someone else who just takes damage conversion, so every time they get hit with any kind of damage that they get some sort of ability, what you do is you would give a limiter to his damage conversion to say it only applies to fire damage, and it can only be output as maybe a fire attack. I mean, it depends on the types of flexibility you want to have for the character. Well, it's, but it's yeah, you can customize all of them. It's, oh, it's not limited. Okay. Right. So if if he got hit with if he got hit with lightning, it would be the same principle. He got if he got hit okay. with energy with like oh so like it's, it's so it's energy, okay. Yeah, but if he got slashed with a sword, it wouldn't apply. No. Right. The, right. So in that case, the limiter would be energy rather than just fire itself. Is he would have damage conversion with the energy limiter, uh, yeah. and that would be what he could end up doing. The closest analogy I can think of is Bishop from X Men. Mm, right. Oh. Um, Obviously, without the whole future stuff, but his whole thing yeah. is um, storing and rechanneling energy. Yeah, um, and, and we have attributes built in that, that uh, deal with us. Mm -hmm. So next on the list would be Amelia Curtis, a.k.a. Sonic Bloom, who... Her, we wanted to do a speedster, but we wanted to be... We wanted to do something a bit unique, especially since we also rolled air manipulation. So the idea came to me is that she creates these pockets of air that she is able to go through to cannonball herself, kind of like a boost ring in a, in a 3D Sonic game. Mm, the, right. the idea is she's able to use, use multiple ones to essentially pinball herself around. The problem is she's not very good at the breaking part. Ah, uh, so, yes. So frequent, there's the running joke that... Free, that her approach to get to um to be especially given her given her daredevil aspects um they keep a, they keep it when they're doing attendance they keep a window open just in case she decides to fly through that way sometimes oh. the window pro <laughs> sometimes the window works sometimes she misses and hits right. the and hits the wall other times she makes it but but they open up the wrong window <laughs> right and there are numerous ways to do a character like that. Obviously, with, you know, with super speed, you're going to have you know, whatever kind of uh, limiter you want to have—an environmental type limiter. If it's limited to these using these rings, it might be your equipment, uh, or it could be something that's more, uh, you know, a, a social limiter. And so, it's an easy way to to bring the power of a super speed down. But in terms of her ability about not being able to to control it as well as a traditional speedster uh, that could be expressed through a number of different defects uh, you could do it with a, you're know, cursed if it's something that that kind of has that feel to it or it could be even a, a physical you know, disadvantage where you could have it that it's it, there's a physical impairment that she'd have the reason why that's happening it depends on what the the expression of the if, character and if it helps, and with the, she's a she's effectively a living cannonball Right, but in terms of why, you'd look at the reason why the character is having these troubles, and is it because they're klutzy, and so you're, it's just a straight-up stat issue, or is it because that there's something metaphysical about the problem they has, in which case it might be a curse? So you'd look at the, yeah. the reason why something happens, and that will point you to the best uh, character attributes or defects. Mm -hmm. I will note that some, there were a few points of inspiration for her, one of them is the weird, wild, and wacky world of the early days of aviation, where anybody who was willing to get into a plane was some measure of crazy. Um, some argue that that's still that's still the case for anybody who's willing to get into a a multi-million-dollar coffin. Um, the 
The other was um, around that time. Around the time I was writing, I was writing. I ended up finding out about um, the insanity that was Rally Group B in World Rally Championship, and how the uh, how the lowered restrictions in that division of Rally resulted in these cars that were half as heavy but had these ridiculously charged engines. So you're getting a lot more power and a lot less weight. Mm. But because you're having a lot less weight, it's a lot trickier to handle on turns. Right, right. Uh, and the and when I say when I say that Group B got crazy, I'm I'm talking the FIA, the governing body for both that and Formula One, had assigned shrinks to drivers after races because of how insane the um, races could get. But next on the list is Irvine Thales, a.k.a. Hadron, who's, his big thing is being able to manipulate space-time to make um, gravity wells, as well as being able to make himself intangible. Not invisible, just intangible. Right. The gravity wells are created through these black spheres that that essentially increase or decrease gravity around where they're where they are right and so with a character that is dealing with um uh it's kind of like the the two components so one is the, the gravity and the other one i'm sorry what was the other power intangibility right right the intangibility um right and for that one that one's you know, we, we have that dealt with. There's a power called change state. And with change state, you can uh, either become in, invisible, you know, if you can, you know, not be seen at all um, with to go through walls, for example, you can become ga uh, gaseous or liquid. So depending on kind of where you are in that spectrum, sounds like, you know, being intangible is just a straight up intangibility. So that's a straight up power. Mm -hmm. Now with Gravity, it's if it's primarily being used as an attack, you'd probably want to build you know, it around a weapon and just flavor it as the gravity. But if it's a full-on gravity control it, with everything that that involves, that's very much dynamic powers where you would choose a category of influence, whether it's, you know, elemental or gravity, it could be math, it could be keys. It's, you know, you would just choose an area of influence that you have and you would dynamically being able to do whatever it's appropriate in the game and that's where why we have diamond powers it comes up a lot in, in absolute power but it's because a lot of superheroes are themed around a concept rather than you know you have you know four or five individual discrete powers these are ones that are flavored around a theme and it sounds like gravity is definitely fits into one of those yeah he's far more of a area controller rather than a direct combatant right oh but next on the list is Carol Engel, a.k.a. Cordyceps, who is technically a plant manipulator, but it's more to do with, how, with the unique properties of her skin. She has, the, she has millions of little holes that she can implant seeds into and control the growth of those seeds. Well, that's very interesting. So for something like that, we do have an ability called plant control, but with that specific variation, we, you'd want to put a limiter on the, the, it to say it is only the ones that are seeds are implanted into a skin. Otherwise, plant control by itself uh, can cover controlling of any plants, uh, mm -hmm. controlling the growth of it. It might also be appropriate, uh, depending on, is to take the telekinesis with a, a limiter focused on, on vegetation or plants, mm -hmm. which is slightly different than plant control. Uh, but they they are obviously linked, and one of our characters, Bell Shroud, has ability to control plants in such a way. Yeah, um, Car I had when we were writing around Carol ha is the is a, essentially the mother complex of of the group, even making these herbal blends for everybody that are technically healthy for you, but absolute but taste absolutely rancid. You know, like the first time mm. you ever had V eight. Oh yes. <laughs> I don't, I can't, or, or, she is the type of person who would willingly drink carrot juice straight. Oh, wow. <laughs> I, I can take a lot of stuff, but I'm, but when it comes to carrot juice or, or any sort of V8, I'm like, no, no thanks. <laughs> I'm, I'm not doing that. 
I'm not. Sh- I'm not sure if you would either. No, no, it's a uh, it's very very strong carrot juice. It flavors everything extremely heavily, but drinking it straight up, that's that's pretty powerful. Yeah, but the last on the list is Thorvald Eriksson, aka Thrudgelmir. Um, originally, we just had it that he's able to grow, he's able to grow in size up to twenty five feet tall, but we felt that w- that wasn't um, enough. So what we ins- we instead decided to mess around with it that even in his norm even in his normal size his um density for his muscle and for his bones is a lot higher than normal people to the point where he doesn't he doesn't need to wear armor because his th- because um bullet because only only the big only the biggest type of piercing bullets are able to actually um pierce him everything else just bounces off right. unfortunately it does mean he's <laughs> He's three. He's three times hev- He's three times heavier than normal. He's about seven hundred pounds. And the uh, the other thing with him is that he's f- because of, instead of using any sort of arms, his big thing is being able to out wrestle people. Because I, what I drew upon with him was a lot. Of, was a lot of the hard hitting style of um, puro rest that you see in Japan. Um, hmm. Especially, especially some of the guys that made the made up the four pillars of heaven back in the nineties. Oh, yeah. So with that character, I mean, there's the two different aspects. Uh, with if if they can become more dense, or they are more dense, you know, you can they have are. it that they can turn it on and off, or you can have it that they always are. So it's the the density is is again the flavor of what actually happens. So they they're armored. So they have armored skin. So you'd give them armor. You'd give them immovable, which means they can't be knocked back. If you have you know a, a tax that you'll see people you know get hit and then get knocked back into walls. Maybe he has immovable as well. So you'd assign all of the abilities to the character that would stem from them having the extra mass. But then the, the having the extra mass would actually probably be a defect. Uh, we have something characters are larger if, they, if they're, they're large or, or huge. They're not human uh, normal human size. You actually would take a defect that indicates that you know, if you were if you if you're six foot tall and you're just a regular humanoid guy and you weigh a thousand pounds, that well, that's a disadvantage. There's going to be places you can't go. There's things you can't do, and that expectation. So the effects and the disadvantages you play them separately. With the um, the ability, uh, oh, what was that second thing? The um, size changing. You know, so they 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 had the uh, the density, but then there was uh, oh the the wrestling, right? They're good at wrestling, and so we have uh, what's called uh, melee attack and melee defense, and you would focus that on you would choose a type, and you'd say, well, I have melee attack wrestling and melee defense wrestling, so that gives you a bonus in this very specific instance of what you're doing, and so maybe they're not an overall combat master, but they're exceptionally good in wrestling, probably because the weight plays into it, that that extra density, and so you would just buy all the individual powers that's a, a very straightforward build it's a mi- it's in his case it's a mix of his weight and also the fact that um when his when his family saw, when his family saw that he had that kind of talent they put, they put they spent a lot of money to send him to um to a bunch of different um wrestling and sumo dojos in Japan Right, so that's some good training as well, and and that could certainly represent. So he's not going to pick up a, a handgun and be effective with it, but good at wrestling. So that's melee attack and defense. Yeah, and admittedly, I will I will admit that um, Colossus was was certainly an influence, as well as some of the um, some of some of the gym rats that I that I met when I when I um st- when I started training again. Because the, because those guys are some of the most wholesome people you will ever meet. <laughs> mm-hmm. oh, everybody, everybody has this idea of of gym rats being these judgmental types. Absolutely not. They, the best ones are the ones who will who are com- are completely and perfectly willing to help you out or, e- or even spot for you unprompted. Right, <laughs> right. And the experiences with the, with those I had used when when writing how I view, how I view um, Thorvald. He's usually the guy who who ends up breaking up fights because he'll just pick some he'll just 
pick somebody up, put the put them in a high place, and say you you say and say you stay there until you calm down, and just leave mm. just leave them there for a few hours. Nice. Oh, because on on one hand he's he's able to he's able to he's able to fight and probably could stretch somebody out out into a pretzel if wanted. On the other hand, he tr he tries his best not to and. The, and tries to find the easiest way to deal with the situation, which in his case is, well, put put them apart from each apart from each other in some place where they can't reach. <laughs> so if he has to put if he has to if if he has to put say um <laughs> say uh, say Oscar all all the way up at the top of a house, <laughs> then then that's what he'll do. But. The interesting thing with this is that while well, some ideas are just a little bit of flavoring, a few a few of them would definitely be a bit more of a challenge. The way you describe it, it sounds like the trickiest one might be um, hard case. Yeah, it it's probably requires more customization for something like that. Oh. If if only because this isn't this isn't the standard um po um power mimicry. It's Right. It, it it I've des I've described her as the, as akin to a um a bat a battlefield general and her constructs are her particular soldiers or pawns if you will since um one of the things I had with her is that she's all she's a bit of a stiff neck but it's more of always trying to find the right strategy for everything. The problem is because of that she doesn't have very good initiative. And it's also the reason why she absolutely can't stand Finn because Finn is the embodiment of is the embodiment of chaos when it comes to the group. Whereas she's always trying to do things as by as by the book, for lack of a better term, as possible. Right. And Finn does Finn as if you give Finn a book to do it by, he'll he'll just he'll just use the book for whatever his next prank is. Um, I will admit, when it came to his pranks, I drew upon some of my own experience with pranking. One of which is the reason why nobody trusts me with coffee anymore. Because I messed with the I messed with the coffee machine, and as well as as well as the at as well as the add-ons, so people thought they were putting sugar in their coffee when in reality they were putting in salt. Oh no. <laughs> <laughs> or. Or um, instead instead of thinking that they're putting in cr um, creamer, they're actually putting in coconut water. Oh, jeez. <laughs> yeah, and afterwards, I was banned from. Afterwards, I was banned from the coffee machine. Or <laughs> um, I ended up ruining Thanksgiving once by by swapping out the jellied cranberry sauce with red beets, and nobody realized oh, wow. until they started eating. Mm -hmm. Um. Afterwards, I was given a lifetime ban from the kitchen. Hmm. <laughs> Any time, any time there's one of those things, I am not, al I am not allowed, because nobody trusts me to not pull that. Yeah, thing again. yeah. Thing is that I don't have to pull that thing again. Just once is enough for everybody to be paranoid. Right. But it's not like I was. It's not like I was doing anything all that unorthodox. It's just. It was just standard swaps. Is it? It's a case of anybody can do it, but do you have the brass balls to actually pull through with it? Right, <laughs> but with the, with that in mind, um, what would you be shooting for as far as a release window for the PDF version? I know with the printed version, that's its own brand of hell for at least um, seasons one and two. Right. Yeah. If everything goes well, uh, when the it ends in October nineteenth is when the backer kit ends. It takes a few weeks to process. You know, payments through the system and then we'd get the surveys out uh, and so we're looking at you know early to mid November and the products are more or less finished now and so we're just waiting you know once everything is processed then we can send out the digital copies and then the print copies we're looking at spring of next year after it gets printed and shipped and whatnot so uh, yeah once again we're running a, a crowdfunding campaign for products that we we wanted to make sure they were to a level of doneness to give people that confidence that they could back it knowing they're going to get the products quickly yep oh um, well spring spring is a good time to release to to release things because while everything is blooming 
it's always important to remember that ev- that the leaves bloom in the spring, except in Toronto. The leaves <laughs> fall in the spring. <laughs> yeah, the leaves are going to be my yeah. whipping boy. For... <laughs> now that is that is a, you know a, a good hockey joke. <laughs> well, I'll stop. I'll stop picking on the leaves when they stop act when they stop acting like they're Canada's gift to hockey. Mm. Especially when they haven't done any, haven't been able to, haven't been able to win the cup in f- over fifty years. And well, they find new, they find new ways to make me laugh at them. Because <laughs> I learned a long time ago that that the gods of luck do not like arrogance. There's a reason why the the one person who always ends up botching is the person who thinks that it that the role is going to be easy. Oh yeah, of course. Like the D, it's a DC of five. There's no way you can screw this up. And then they roll a one. One, yeah. Or in your, in your case, in your case, um, it it's low difficulty, and they roll nothing but snake eyes. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, and when usually in my, usually at my table, whenever whenever somebody sa- says, "Oh," so I, does the old "Oh, I got this in the bag," I usually say, "I'd advise knocking on wood right now, and unless, unless you want to risk the ire of the dice gods." Mm-hmm. And they blow it off. They end up bot. They end up botching. I'm like, I told you. Like, much like how there are no atheists in foxholes, I believe there are no atheists at the gaming table. Oh right. Um, uh, there's a reason why nobody, why no, why nobody likes borrowing other people's dice. Yeah, the luck. Yeah, it's it's. Be- well, I think that's the reason they keep me around because they expect me to bless the dice. Hmm. As well, monks have pulled double duty as priests. But with all that said, I do want to sincerely thank you for taking your time out of your taking the time out of your schedule to come all the way to my temple and enjoy the madness that happens here. And anytime you see fit to return, the door is always open. As I often say around here, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. And of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took t- the time out of their schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness. And there will be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here, on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra, I am your gaming monk, stay fucking frosty everybody! <laughs>